The universe is full of wonderful, magnificent things. We have colliding galaxies, black holes devouring stars. We have highly energetic explosions. And there are mysteries that we don't understand yet. Humankind has pushed the boundaries of technology to try to unravel these mysteries, to probe these wonders. We have mounted space stations, built particle colliders, and constructed telescopes. This evening, I want to tell you about the coolest telescope in existence. This telescope is called Ice Cube, and it's located here at the South Pole. But you can't actually see it in this picture because it's one and a half kilometers to two and a half kilometers deep underneath the ice. If we could get down there, this is an artist's picture of what we might see. This is our telescope. You might be thinking, how can you have a telescope underneath the ground? How can a telescope that's one and a half, two and a half kilometers deep, how can such a telescope see anything? And the reason is that this telescope is not trying to detect the light that the universe sends us, but instead we're trying to detect neutrinos from the universe. Neutrinos are elementary particles. They're neutral. They're rather like an electron, but they have no electric charge. Neutrinos are fantastic cosmic messengers because they very rarely interact. They can travel from the edges of the universe and from the most dense objects in the universe. They can travel out of objects so dense that nothing else can escape, no light, no x-rays. So neutrinos, hold up your thumb. One second, a hundred billion neutrinos pass through your thumb in that second. That's a hundred thousand million neutrinos pass through your thumb. The source of those neutrinos is our sun. And those neutrinos, they, took, they were created in the center of our sun, and they took about two seconds to get to the surface, and then around eight minutes to get um, to the Earth. Compare that, actually, to, the, to light. The light that's produced in our sun, it takes about 300,000 years to get from the center where it's created um, out to the surface. Then it also takes eight minutes to get here. But the neutrinos, those 100 billion that are passing through every square centimetre of your body, your thumb is not special, they travel through every <laughs> square centimetre of your body, and they travel through there day or night, because neutrinos also just pass straight through the Earth. So when you're lying in bed, there'll still be 100 billion neutrinos passing up through the Earth, through your bed, and through your every square centimetre of your body, every second. So... How, why are neutrinos, how, how can it be, people always ask, how, how do neutrinos pass? Well, we have to think about atoms. Now, New Zealand's most famous son, Ernest Rutherford, discovered that the meat of an atom, the most mass of the atom, which 99.9% .9 of the mass of an atom is contained in its nucleus, which takes up a trillionth of the volume of the atom. The rest of the volume of the atom is taken up with very low mass electrons. So if we scale an atom up to the size of this room, then the nucleus, with all of the, essentially all of the mass of the atom, will be a grain of sand in the centre of this room. So you can see atoms are essentially empty space. So your thumb, my body, the earth, it's all empty space because we're made of atoms. And as I said, an atom, all of its mass is concentrated in a grain of sand with a room of, of space around it. But of course, it doesn't feel like empty space. It doesn't feel like empty space or look like empty space when I'm standing here. And that's because the way things feel and the way things look is all fundamentally about interactions, interactions between atoms, between particles. So in atoms, there are electrons, and electrons don't like being where other electrons are. So when I stamp my foot here on the, on the stage, then the electrons in the atoms in my foot are fighting the electrons in the atoms on the stage. 
So that's why it feels solid, because of the push between the electrons in my foot and the electrons in the stage. However, neutrinos, they hardly interact at all. They're very weakly interacting, essentially because they're neutral. So to a neutrino, an atom looks like a swathe. Atoms look like swathes of empty space, as do our bodies, as do the Earth. So the neutrinos can just sail through that empty space, because they just see it all as empty space with the odd sand in the room scattered around. So neutrinos are wonderful cosmic messengers because they can just travel through this empty space of the universe. However, they're very challenging, challenging cosmic messengers because if, you, if they don't interact at all, how can we detect them? And so there's the problem. But they barely interact, but barely is not, not at all. So if we can put enough targets in front of the neutrino, then we have a chance. So we multiply up that small probability by putting a large number of targets in the neutrino. So we want a mountain-sized target to put in front of the neutrino. Now, when a neutrino does interact, it produces some charged particles, and those charged particles produce light that we can detect. So when a neutrino interacts, it produces other particles, they produce light, and then the other particles are travelling in the same direction as the neutrino. So if we travel, we track the light that is produced by those charged particles, we can work out their direction and then in turn the direction of the, of the uh, neutrinos. So that's what we want to do, and that's what a, a collaboration I'm involved with called Ice Cube Collaboration, that's what we do do. So we wanted um, a large volume of ice, and that's where the South Pole came in. We needed a really mountain-sized target of something transparent, because we want, once the neutrino interacts, and produces the other particles, we want to be able to detect that light. So we need to have something transparent. We could have gone with a kilometre by kilometre by kilometre block of glass, or a huge tank of water underground, but those are not very feasible and definitely not very cheap. It's better to go with something that already exists, which is the ice at the South Pole. So we have deployed 5,000 light sensors distributed across 80 cables and 60, 60 light sensors per cable across 80 cables at the South Pole. So we have an array of 5,000 um, light sensors in the very clear ice at the South Pole. To deploy these uh, cables, we first had to melt a hole in the ice. So first we use a, a normal kind of drill to make a hole, and then a specially developed hot water um, drill which pumps hot water down into the hole. So what we do, we can't just take the ice out of the hole, it's two and a half kilometres deep, so there would uh, be a massive hole if it was a dry hole. But what we're actually doing is melting the ice. So we get a two and a half kilometre cylinder of water. And it takes around um, two days to melt each hole. And then we lower the cables, which is lower them down with gravity. We lower them down into the holes. And each cable has 60 of these light sensors attached. It takes around 11 hours to lower it down. And we have around 30 hours before the ice starts to refreeze again as we're lowering the cable down. Then it takes around actually a month or more for the ice to completely freeze. And once it's completely frozen, um, there's no way we can get the detectors out. So the detectors are there for good in the ice now. The detectors are housed in a, the light sensors here, they're housed in a pressure resistant glass canister because when the water refreezes, becomes ice, it expands, and so there's very great pressure. So we had to develop very um, pressure resistant glass canisters to house it. There also, there is um, some computing housed in there which turns the light sensor, light um, detection into an electric um, signal which is sent up the cables to a computers on the surface. 
Here in this animation, you can see the principle for how we detect um, neutrinos. So a neutrino comes in and creates a charged particle that travels through our detector, producing light that we detect with the sensors. So I'll just play it again. So you see a neutrino, there was an interaction producing the charged particle that traveled through our detector, producing light. Here, each of the tiny black dots that you can see is one of our light sensors, one of the 5,000. And then the size of the sphere shown there is showing how much light was detected by each sensor that detected light. And the color shows the timing, with red being the first um, sensors to get light and green being the last. So you can just see visually that's what we have as a recording. We don't actually see anything passing through, of course, we just get this recording. But you can see how from that we can reconstruct the direction of the charged particle and of the neutrino. So that's what, what we're doing. Earlier I mentioned that the sun is a prolific producer of neutrinos. That's not actually the only source of neutrinos on Earth. Things like nuclear reactors, radioactive decays in the center of the Earth, radioactive decays in our own body. We all produce around 340 million neutrinos per day, each of us. Um, but none of those neutrinos are the neutrinos that we're after. We're after neutrinos that come from the highest energy regions of the universe, and they have probably a million to a trillion times more energy than the, the neutrinos produced in radioactive decays or from the sun. So um, the motivation for us in constructing IceCube was to find the source of the highest energy cosmic rays. So cosmic rays are charged particles, mostly protons, and there are cosmic rays which have a million times more energy than anything we've ever created on Earth and actually likely to ever be able to create on Earth. A million times more energy than we, anything we have created continuously bombarding our Earth. So don't worry, they, they can't harm you. They are radiation. They can't harm you because luckily the Earth's atmosphere protects us. That energy is dissipated in the atmosphere. We would love to know where these charged particles come from where these extremely energetic particles come from. If we did know where they come from, we could study those high energy sources. It would be a high energy laboratory for us. We'd be able to test our, our um, theories of physics, how things work in these extreme environments. So these are environments million times more energetic than our sun. The trouble is we don't know where these cosmic rays come from. It might be something like a um, exploding star or objects devouring other objects, but we don't know. You might think that we could just point our telescopes in the direction that the charged particles came from. And while we can, we can detect the direction that the charged particles come as they come into the atmosphere, the trouble is they're charged and charged particles are bent in magnetic fields. So even though we can detect the direction that they come into our atmosphere, that doesn't tell us where they've come from because there are magnetic fields spread throughout the universe and throughout our galaxy. So although we can detect them, we don't know where they're coming from. So we know there's something out there producing all this energy, but we don't know what it is or where it is. But what we want is a neutral particle, neutrino, because neutral particles are not affected by magnetic fields. And we know that neutrinos should be produced in the same places that these cosmic rays are produced. And the neutrinos that we want to detect then should be able to point back and tell us where these cosmic rays are coming from. So this is, this is the, our aim with IceCube, is to locate, detect, neutrinos coming from the highest regions of the universe and allow them to point back and show us where they're coming from. So we have actually detected, so IceCube, um, because it's at, at Antarctica, it, can on, it could only be um, constructed during um, the summer months, so when it's light in Antarctica. 
And so it took us seven years to construct it from 2004 to 2010. So in 2010 it was completed and we've been taking data with it since then. And we have detected some really high energy neutrinos. So remember, again here you can see these black dots that are showing the extent of our detector, that each of the sensors, and it's a kilometer by a kilometer by a kilometer. And so this is light spread over that region that has been created by a neutrino. So this is an extremely energetic neutrino, and um, we have detected around 40 of these neutrinos, and we've detected their direction. And so far, when we've looked in those directions, we haven't been able to see any object, any known object that's been detected with light or X-rays in those directions. It might be, because neutrinos can come from so far, that the objects themselves are very faint and we can't actually see them from light. Or maybe those objects are surrounded by dense material so that light can't get, get out. But now we have those directions and we are pointing other kinds of telescopes, gamma ray telescopes, which get really high energy photons, to see, now that we have the direction, to see if they can see anything. And we are taking more data because we only have around 40 of these high energy neutrinos that we are sure have come from astrophysical objects. So we only have 40 of these so far. So if we, we are going to take more data, and we hope that with more that we might be able to get some clustering that will really show us particular directions to, to look. So although we don't know where they came from, we can still speculate and we believe it could be, as I mentioned, one of these black holes that's devouring material around it, and as it devours it, it creates um, a swirling mass of matter around it, which we already know does produce high-energy radiation, but we don't know if it produces uh, where the, cho the charged cosmic rays are coming from. It could be something called a gamma-ray burst, which releases in just um, a minute the amount of energy that the sun will release over its entire lifetime. And so in that minute, it outshines anything else in the universe. It could be these gamma ray bursts that are producing the cosmic rays. But so far, we haven't seen any relationship between our neutrinos and these gamma ray bursts. We do think that the neutrinos have come from outside our own galaxy. That's because we don't, haven't seen anything nearby that has the sort of energies that we would need. And also, the direction that the neutrinos we have seen is spread out over all of the, all of the um, space and not correlated with the plane of our galaxy. The plane of our galaxy is what you see when you look at the Milky Way in the sky. So if they were coming from our own galaxy, we would expect to see them clustering in the direction of the Milky Way. But, but they're not. So we're not sure what it is that's producing, but we're still looking. So the message I want to share with you tonight is that neutrinos are opening a new window on the universe. And soon we hope we will have a laboratory for studying high energy physics and for developing our theories for the way matter interacts at these highest energies. And with that understanding, will then perhaps become new technologies as well. Thank you.